It was this very subject in anthropology class that first got me interested in linguistics. Hello, my name is Christopher and welcome to Lei Ling, Linguistics for the Layperson. Today, we're going to discuss the sapir whorf hypothesis and linguistic relativity. Now, those terms may seem somewhat intimidating at first, but worry not, because it's really not that complicated. So, basically, the hypothesis suggests that language isn't merely a vehicle for articulating ideas, but rather its structure actually affects the outlook of its speakers. And this is where relativity comes in. People's perceptions of reality are therefore relative to their native language or languages. You see, how we see the world is controlled in part by our thinking, by the inner monologue you can't seem to shut down just as you're trying to sleep. And the first language we speak regulates that thought process. After all, have you ever wondered what language a deaf person from birth thinks in? We might have to cover that in another video. So, if language shapes your thinking, it follows that it must impact how you experience reality. And this, of course, should have major ramifications. Indeed, anyone who has studied two dissimilar languages can attest to how they operate differently from each other and how some ideas don't translate well. But to what extent does this impact our worldview? Now, there are really two different versions of the theory. Sociolinguist Edward Sapir and his student Benjamin Whorf were advocates of the stronger form known as linguistic determinism, which states that language itself is actually responsible for determining thought to the extent that the properties of a language govern aspects of cognitive function. This idea was more popular in the early 20th century and is not accepted by modern linguists. Some, however, still believe in the weaker form, which states that language structures simply influence, rather than determine outright, the mind's thoughts and decisions. I, for one, would put myself in this category. Perhaps the best example of the theory involves colour. You see, researchers have found that our brains tend to exaggerate the difference between similar shades if they have unique names in our language. Of course, this doesn't mean that the photoreceptors in the retina of someone who speaks a language with fewer colour words would perceive fewer shades. No, it's just that his or her mind would have a more difficult time recognising them as different colours. For instance, the ancient Greeks, as advanced a civilization as they enjoyed, famously had no word for blue. In the Odyssey, Homer describes the sea as wine dark, and the sky has no colour at all. You see, blue appears very rarely in nature, and as a result, is the last major colour to appear in language, after black, white, red, yellow, and green in that order. In fact, the only ancient culture to have a word for the elusive colour was the Egyptians, who just so happened to have a way of producing a beautiful blue dye. Again, it's not as if the Greek eye and the Egyptian eye observed a differently coloured world. Rather, the Greek mind and the Egyptian mind perceived it differently as a result of their spoken language, not their biology. There's a modern case of this involving the Himba tribe in Namibia, whose language also has no word for blue. When shown by researchers this circle with 11 green squares and one blue square, they had a remarkably difficult time identifying which one was different from the others. However, the Himba, perhaps out of a need to discern ripeness easily, I'm just speculating, have more words for green than we do in English, and could immediately detect the green square of a slightly different shade. Can you? It's not that easy. The Himba brain is thus primed to notice the colour differences thanks to the language and culture, not because of superior cone cells or something. 
If you've grown up without unique words for different colors, you're less sensitive to the contrast and it's more difficult to identify them as distinct. And this applies in similar areas as well, like the Eskimo having dozens of words for snow, although in fairness that's also just due to the special morphology of their languages. A different example is how in English we no longer make a distinction between the informal thou and the formal you. In many other languages, however, including the Romance family, there's very much a difference in how you address someone depending on his or her title, forcing native speakers from childhood to categorize people into one of these social groups. Now, as you may have noticed, these cases would better support the weak hypothesis over linguistic determinism, because they all seem to influence the speaker's reality rather than completely dictating it. After all, the Himba people could still detect the blue square, it just took longer for them than it would for you or me. Likewise, we could learn all the subtleties of Eskimo snow with time. Your mother tongue doesn't affect intelligence, but it can play a detectable role in your perception. If languages were alone responsible for controlling thought, intercultural communication would be very difficult, as would the capacity for languages to evolve and adopt new words, which they clearly do. Translation and learning a second language would be next to impossible if our native language dictated truly unique modes of thinking. We're all human after all, and our physiological needs transcend linguistic variation. Perhaps this could be a problem, however, if we ever encounter intelligent extraterrestrial life. I'm not sure. That would make for some very interesting research. All right, that's all for today. Please leave a like if you learned something and let me know in the comment section what you think about the sapient wharf hypothesis and linguistic relativity. Is there anything that didn't make sense or which you'd like for me to explore more deeply? Don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss out on the next video in this series. As always, my sources are in the description. And with that, thank you so much for watching.